Like many veterans, this last week has been one that has seen me struggle through anger and grief and rage. The feeling abandonment of not just a country, but the sacrifice that my friends made. I've been to funerals from Poole to Dunblane. I've watched good men go into the earth, taking with them a part of me and a part of all of us. And this week has torn open some of those wounds, left them raw, left us all hurting. And I know it's not just soldiers. I know aid workers and diplomats who feel the same. I know journalists who've been the witnesses to our country in its heroic effort to save people from the most horrific fates. I know that we've all been struggling. And if this recall has done one thing, let me tell you now, Mr Speaker, it's achieved one thing already. I've spoken to the Health Secretary, who's already made a commitment to do more for veterans' mental health. Yeah. Yeah. This isn't just about us. The mission in Afghanistan wasn't a British mission, it was a NATO mission. It was a recognition that globalisation has changed us all. The phone calls that I am still receiving, the text messages that I've been answering as I've been waiting, putting people in touch with our people in Afghanistan, reminds us that we are connected. We are connected still today. And Afghanistan is not a far country about which we know little. It is part of the main. That connection links us also to our European partners, to our European neighbours, and to our international friends. And so it is with great sadness that I now criticise one of them. Because I was never prouder than when I was decorated by the 82nd Airborne after the capture of Musakala. It was a huge privilege, a huge privilege to be recognised by such an extraordinary unit in combat. To see their Commander-in-Chief call into question the courage of men I fought with, to claim that they ran. It's shameful. Those who have never fought for the colours they fly should be careful about criticising those who have. Because what we've done in these last few days is we've demonstrated that it's not armies that win wars. Armies can get tactical victories and operational victories that can hold a line. They can just about make room for peace, make room for people like us to talk, to compromise, to listen. It's nations that make war. Nations endure. Nations mobilize and muster. Nations determine and have patience. And here we've demonstrated Sadly, that we, the West, the United Kingdom, does not. Now, this is a harsh lesson for all of us. And if we're not careful, it could be a very, very difficult lesson for our allies. But it doesn't need to be. We can set out a vision, clearly articulated, for reinvigorating our European NATO partners to make sure that we are not dependent on a single ally, on the decision of a single leader, but that we can work together with Japan and Australia, with France and Germany, with partners large and small, and make sure that we hold the line together. Because we know that patience wins. We know it because we have achieved it. We know it because we have delivered it. The Cold War was won with patience. Cyprus is at peace with patience. South Korea, with more than 10 times the number of troops that, us, that America had in Afghanistan, is prosperous through patience. 
So let's stop talking about forever wars. Let's recognise that forever peace is bought, not cheaply, but hard, through determination and the will to endure. And that the tragedy of Afghanistan is that we're swapping that patient achievement for a second fire and a second war. Now we need to turn our attention to those who are in desperate need. Supporting the UNHCR, the World Food Programme and so many other organisations who can do so much for people in the region. Yes, supporting refugees, of course I support refugees, though I'm not going to get into the political auction of numbers. We just need to get people out. So I leave with one image. In the year that I was privileged to be the advisor to the Governor of Helmand, we opened girls' schools. And the joy it gave parents to see their little girls going to school was extraordinary, and I didn't understand it until I took my own daughter to school about a year ago. And there was a lot of crying when she first went in, but I got over it, and <laughs> <laughs> it went okay. And I would love to see that continue. But there is a second image I must leave you with, and it is a harder one. But I'm afraid it is one that I think we must all remember. Will you wait? It's only for a minute. It's only for a minute. And I wonder if you could say a bit more about that second image. <laughs> I'm very grateful to my friend who was watching the clock more than me. The second image is one that the forever war that has just reignited could lead to. It is the image of a man whose name I never knew, carrying a child who had died hours earlier, carrying this child into our firebase and begging for help. Now, there was nothing we could do. It was over. Because, Mr. Speaker, this is what defeat looks like. It's when you no longer have the choice as to how to help. This doesn't need to be defeat. But at the moment, damn well feels like it. Yeah. Ed Davey.